partners of Corner Shop Creative. Uh, we're a shop that serves mostly nonprofits, and we're probably about 70% WordPress. But I have a lot to talk about today, so I'm not going to talk much about myself. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, making your website faster. So um, hopefully you're all here because you understand that speed matters. Um, your, how fast your website loads actually affects your SEO. It's an SEO thing, like Google's PageRank algorithm includes site speed as one of its factors. So you can spend all your life on meta tags, and if your site loads slow, you're sort of hurting yourself. Um, it's a part of the user experience. Um, people who, you know, people might not consciously hey, think to themselves, hey, I prefer that website to that other one because it's faster. Um, but it, subconsciously, it shapes people's behaviors and patterns and stuff like that. Uh, it affects sales too. I mean, uh, you know, Amazon and other places of shops have figured out, you know, a, a quarter second delay in how long a website loads can affect sales, like 7%, I think was the metric that I last saw. Um, so, I mean, speed is, you know, it affects all your conversion rates, all your sales, everything. Um, and it's actually getting increasingly important as sort of the mobile web takes over. Uh, I felt like there was a while there in web development where we all got, I want to say a little lazy, but it was sort of like, well, more and more people have broadband. We don't have to really worry about these stupid dial-up modems anymore. Like, let's go crazy and have big images and all this sort of stuff. And it was fun for a while. And now this mobile is coming along. And suddenly, I mean, yeah, we're, more of us have 4G and that sort of thing. But um, a lot of the issues I'm going to talk about today are, are sort of exacerbated under mobile um, compared to like a traditional desktop experience. Um, but yeah, so speed matters. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, a bunch of stuff today. Um, I'm going to be talking about payload size, which is really just the basics of like don't send giant images if you don't need to send giant images. Uh, I'm going to be talking about making sure that your HTML and your CSS markup is sort of clean and efficient. Um, we're going to talk about HTTP connections and JavaScript blocking. Those two, those the three to four on this list here, those are sort of the big ones that I'm going to focus mostly on. And I, those are the things that if you don't know much about um, and you're interested in having a fast site, these are things that you need to know. Um, and then if I have time, I'm going to briefly mention DNS lookups and like some other tools and stuff like that you can use to rate your site. Um, a couple of things I want to point out that will come up during the presentation is that uh, some of this stuff is stuff that affects the actual load time of your site, you know, how long until the little spinny thing stops. Um, some of these are actually things that don't necessarily affect how fast your site loads, but it affects how fast your per users perceive your site to load. Um, things like how long it takes to render CSS on a page and stuff like that. Um, you know, might not be taken into account um, you know, by Google or something like that, but um, having, having styles applied more quickly um, just makes the fight site seem faster or seem more responsive. Um, there's a couple things that I'm not going to talk about today. Um, that's back-end stuff, basically, um, which also has a huge impact and is stuff that you should be thinking about if you haven't already. Um, you know, how fast is my MySQL database? How fast you know, is Apache set up properly to handle the number of connections that I want it to be having? And is Keep Alive turned on or off? That kind of stuff. Um, using a CDN, that's a content delivery network, you can argue that that's a front end thing because it kind of is. But uh, it's just kind of outside of the purview of what I'm talking about today. Um, CDNs can be great. They can also be kind of a pain. Um, and choosing a good host, which is sort of deciding which of these, you know, figuring out which of these things are important and who does a good job of it and who does a bad job of it. Um, and hopefully I don't offend anybody by saying, try not to use GoDaddy. Um, for a variety of reasons. Um, anyway, so the first thing I want to talk about is reducing payload. This is uh, front end performance 101. This is just like sending fewer bits to the browser when somebody is loading your page. That's all we're talking about here. Um, so there are a couple techniques um, to reduce the size of the assets that you're sending to the user. Um, so the first one is just minifying your JavaScript and your CSS and even your HTML. Uh, minifying is just you know, stripping out white space, you know, carriage returns, spaces, you know, shortening variable names from meaningful things that developers can read to letters that just take up fewer, less space. It makes these things you know, not human readable and sort of inconvenient, but uh, it also saves a lot of space. You know, just because a space character doesn't sort of occupy space on the screen, it occupies as many bits or bytes as any other character. So you're saving space by eliminating those. Um, there are plenty of scripts out there and tools uh, to minify and compress and uglify your JavaScript, and we'll talk a little bit more about that maybe. Um, the next thing is loading properly sized images. Um, I've seen several clients using you know, crummy plugins and slideshow things and whatnot that you know, they just sort of wrote some CSS to resize the slideshow to fit in a sidebar. And so the images are being displayed to the users at 300 pixels by 200 pixels. But if you right click and view like, you know, the source of the image, it's like 1,000 by 2,000. Um, WordPress is actually pretty good at scaling things down if you write your themes right to sort of you know, convert the image to the right size and send it to the browser. But 
um, it's still easy to screw that up. So it's just sort of basic 101. Um, you know, use images of proper size. Also, if you're caring about retina, um, really try to do your best. Um, there aren't really good solutions. The web is still trying to figure this out. But, um, you know, some people are like, oh, well, the easiest solution to that is just send everybody your double-sized images and, you know, their browsers will scale it down. It's like, well, yeah, but, you know, you're sort of effectively doubling the payload for most people who don't have retina or high DPI stuff. Um, so if you can, try to spend some time making sure that you're sending users the, the images that they want to be getting for the size they're viewing them at. Um, and then last but not least, I mean, this is a technique that's been around since the great and old days of tables. Uh, you just use the right image file types. You know, I mean, if you've got, if you have a need for transparency, you know, use a ping. If you've got a photo, use a JPEG. You know, if you really need it to be a lossless photo, I suppose you could send a ping, but it's probably going to be smaller as a JPEG. Um, you know, there's a lot of automated tools, Photoshop, save for the web, that kind of thing, but um, I still find that if you would take the time to do sort of human intervention and compare compression and stuff like that, you can squeeze sort of more quality per byte if you take the time to really, really love this stuff. Um, there are some other things you can do sort of that I consider falling under the purview of re reducing the payload, um, and that's just not loading stuff on page load. Um, so one of the things, techniques you've probably seen is called lazy loading. Uh, and basically the idea is, is that, you know, if you've got an image at the bottom of your page and it's, you know, off the scrollable area, you know, it's like people have to scroll down before they get to that image, don't load that image when the page is first loaded. Nobody can see it. It's off the window. Um, what you should do is you should, you know, have a little bit of JavaScript that watches for the user scrolling and as they scroll, as soon as the image gets close to the viewport or in the viewport, then load the image. Um, so if you've you know, been to major news sites or whatever and you find you, know, you scroll down really fast, you'll see like the images that look like they're fading in. Um, that's not probably a, just a, you know, a cool UX technique to make the images fade in. Um, they're actually saying, hey, we're not going to send you a bunch of images until you're actually looking at them. Um, browsers are actually really smart in terms of parsing your CSS. So if you have, if you have an image in like a div that says display none, the browser won't load that because it knows that no one's going to see it. Um, but they don't know, they're not paying attention to like your window size. So you have to do things like use jQuery plugins or whatever to lazy load. Um, another thing you can do is use uh, defer and async. These are attributes of the script element. Um, I think async is the one that's technically HTML5 and defer is the one that a bunch of browsers were using before HTML5 and still use. Um, I might have that backwards. Um, basically, the idea behind these is, and we'll get more into the JavaScript loading, in a bit, but basically the idea behind these is that rather than loading the JavaScript, uh, you know, as soon as the user hits the page and you know, the browser's parsing the tag and gets to that JavaScript and says, oh, I need to load this file, rather than stopping everything and loading just that file, um, one of these tags, these tags sort of tell the browser, no, actually, you can hold off on loading this file until the rest of the page is done. And then you can circle back and load this script. Um, defer and async do behave a little bit differently uh, in terms of when the so browser sort of circles back and starts loading them. Um, and I could talk about that, but I'm, I'm not going to. You can sort of Google that on your own. Um, the differences are pretty minor. Basically, async, you know, if you have three async scripts in a row, there's no guarantee that the first one is going to load, then the second one, then the third. Defer is still going to kind of loop back in sequence and hit them in the order that you posted them. Um, and then the last thing is loading pre-cached stuff. Um, what I mean by that is, you know, things like jQuery that lots of people are using on the Internet. There's no real reason for your WordPress site and your website to have your own copy of jQuery. Your jQuery is the same as everybody else's jQuery, of that version at least. So rather than loading your own jQuery and forcing the user's browser to go get it and you know, having it bit for bit be exactly the same version as the 30 other sites they were just at that also loaded jQuery, um, use a hosted one. And basically, this is getting back to using a CDN. Um, use the copy of jQuery that Google hosts. Right? If we all started using the copy of jQuery that Google hosts, then the first time I visited a website that day or in that browser session, I would download jQuery. Every other website I visited, I would already have jQuery. It would be pre-cached. It would be on my browser. I wouldn't need to get it from each individual website. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that in a second here. Um, briefly about the async and defer stuff. Um, so this presentation didn't start as a WordPress presentation when it was first born. I've sort of hacked it into being a WordPress presentation. but. Um, this is sort of a, a technique for adding those defer and async tags. If you're, if you're embedding scripts in your theme or your site properly, um, you're using the WP and Q script function and not just sort of like putting script tags in your site. Um, that's like the right way to do it. 
Um, but if you want to use WP and QScript and you're still wondering, well, how do I get those async and defer attributes in there? Um, this function will do it sort of for you. Basically, there's a filter called clean URL that WordPress runs all of your enqueued scripts and styles and stuff through. Um, and so this kind of looks at it and it looks for the pound async in the URL. And if it finds it, it actually tacks on async to what it winds up outputting to the browser. Um, you could do the same thing for defer or you know, do them both in the same function or something like that. Um, is this under intelligible to, I mean, what percentage of the people in the room here are developer enough that they, okay, I'm seeing some nods. All right, great. Um, for those of you that this is gobbledygook to, just know that you can do this and it can be done. Um, now talking about using Google's jQuery. Um, this is smart, you should do this. Um, I think it's a really good idea. I'm, I'm yet to hear a compelling argument for why you shouldn't, other than Google might go down. Yeah, well, the odds of Google going down are probably lower than the odds of your host going down. <laughs> so um, I, there, I had one time where Google was being, it was some you know, weird client firewall DNS issue something and they couldn't, they were having trouble with Google and their site was loading fine except for Google and we figured out it was this, but this is the one time. Um, but basically, WordPress comes with jQuery. You're probably loading it. Did you have a question? Or? There's actually something you can do with the Google thing because I have, have seen one. Oh, yeah? There's a way you can have it check and see if jQuery is loaded. If not, fall back and grab the WordPress. Yeah, you can do sort of, yeah, that's, that's the, the really smart way to do it, right? Is, you know, if jQuery and if not, then load the tag up. Um, but this is, you know, most situations this does it. Basically, WordPress comes with jQuery. WordPress generally wants to load jQuery, but it's loading the jQuery that it has and it's your, your install of WordPress. Uh, Tell it, no, 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 deregister that. jQuery doesn't exist anymore. Oh, well, actually, jQuery does exist, but it lives here instead. Um, it lives on googleapis.com. It doesn't live on myawesomewebsite.com. Um, Why does Google currently have a copy of jQuery that's higher than the stable version of jQuery on jQuery's site? Uh, that's not higher than the current stable version of jQuery. It was at least two, days, two, two three days ago. So really? Uh, I don't know why the answer. I don't know what the answer to that is. Yeah, I mean they host everything basically, right. but um, so they still put out the beta. They have to put out the betas and stuff. That's fine. Um, of course, if you're really savvy, you can get your clients to be like, "Yeah, IE sucks." You can use the 2.0 branch of jQuery, and then everything is happier and even faster because it's smaller, because it doesn't have to talk to dumb versions of IE. Anyway, so that's an important <laughs> tip. So. Uh, moving on to bloated DOM and CSS. So DOM, this is you know, your HTML document object model thing. Um, I actually had two friends in Albuquerque. One was named Dom and the other one named was Jason and I loved it when they hung out together. Um, anyway, so this, is, this gets into the, like this is really nitpicky stuff that's not gonna probably save you a whole ton of like, oh my site loads like 10 times faster because I stripped out some divs. Um, <laughs> But it does make a little bit of a difference, uh, particularly if you've got a really bloated site or you're doing a lot of like JavaScript you know, DOM manipulation and you're, you know, you've gone a little jQuery crazy, um, is to just uh, you know, eliminate elements. I mean, because everything, you know, to you it's just, you know, it's a little bit of text, it's a div, it's handy for styling against or something like that. Um, but to your browser, it's more than just a little bit of text. I mean, yes, it's a bit of ASCII that you're sending over in terms of the payload. Um, but it's also an object, like the browser has to keep track of it as an object in its memory and all that kind of stuff. Um, and you wind up with lots and lots and lots of objects if you go sort of div crazy like this. Um, you know, so you can use jQuery or the non-jQuery version to sort of ask a web page in the console, hey, how many elements are on my page? Um, and see if you can do things to reduce that. Um, the benefit of that, again, is that you get a smaller payload, but you also generally get a slightly more responsive site. I mean, it probably doesn't matter most of the time, but if you've got you know, something with 10 bazillion rows on it or something like that, and you're asking jQuery to iterate over each of them to do something, um, you know, it's faster if it's only got 500 rows. Um, and you, know, you, you can go online and find benchmarks for people who have been like, hey, you know, it's faster if you do it this way than this way. Um, but basically, you know, in a nutshell, you know, if you don't need an element, don't create an element. It's just more for the computer to have to think about and sift through. Um, you know, there's, you know, jQuery is often about finding needles in haystacks and doing things to those needles. Shrink the size of the haystack and it finds the needles faster. I just came up with that metaphor, by the way. <laughs> um, related to that, um, keeping your selectors simple. Um, again, this isn't, you know, probably going to have huge impact in the payload, um, but, you know, it takes your browser a little bit of time to go through your page and apply the CSS styles to the elements on the page. It has to read your statements and add them to the page. And 
It happens in basically the blink of an eye, but um, the faster you can blink your eyes, the better off you are. It's just another way to save time. Um, there are another other reasons why you should probably not use a whole bunch of descendant selectors like this, um, because it's a pain in the butt when you need to change something and you have to wind up using bang important and stuff like that. And uh, I think there's a circle of hell where you, all you have is nasty selectors like this. But um, it's just faster. The browser can apply styles to elements faster if it doesn't have to sort of hunt and peck like this. Because the browser actually reads your selectors from right to left. So it goes through and it finds all of the things on your page that have the, the class of inline, and then asks, OK, am I an anchor? And it's like, OK, yes, I'm an anchor. Let's keep going. Then it goes through and says, OK, am I a P? And so it has to percolate back up all the way through the chain to make sure that this whole chain matches and that this, you know, they didn't have some other parent or wasn't missing one of these or something like that. Um, so I mean, it's doing it in, the, you know, in a flash, but it's still having to evaluate like, the amount of, like, you know, if you think of it as a programmer, like, what's the logic required to actually take a CSS selector and get it onto the elements it needs to get on? This top one takes a long time to evaluate. There's a lot of questions you have to ask about, you know, what element am I and am I a child of something or something like that? The bottom one is just bang, I found them, they're done. Um, so, you know, example, like a, a ULLI, a descendant thing, that's slower than a UL with an LI that's a, an immediate child, so I've gotten a little more specific, that's faster. And then just a single class, that's even faster. Um, you know, you can go a little crass, class crazy with this. I'm not saying you have to make everything on your site that you're going to target with CSS a single class. Um, but it's just, it's good to know that it's, it's, you want to keep it clean. Um, and also, interestingly enough, um, browser benchmarks have shown that using classes instead of IDs is faster. Even if there's only one thing of it on the page, um, using a class is, you know, one billionth of a millisecond faster than using an ID. Um, so for whatever that's worth, I mean, I've just sort of gotten a habit that I don't really use IDs anymore because you never know when you might accidentally have a collision anyway and that sort of thing. So IDs are just sort of generally bad. Um, all right, on to the real meat um, is HTTP connections. Um, these are the thing, you know, if you, if you dig one thing out of this presentation, it's going to be this and the JavaScript stuff and not the CSS stuff I just mentioned. Um, but I mean, this is the kind of stuff that can make a a 50K website load slower than a 200K website if you're doing it wrong. So uh, just a little background if I'm, I'm wandered off the reservation a little bit. Uh, an HTTP connection, the idea here is that you know, every asset on your site, an image, a CSS file, a JavaScript file, a font, or whatever, you know, those are all separate files, right? On your server, you're copying up, or you know, you've got like, literally separate files that your browser is fetching when it loads the web page. Um, it might be 10, it might be two dozen, whatever. Um, each one of those, the browser has to go talk to the server and say, hey, you know, please come give me that file. Um, and so because of that, there's a little bit of overhead. You may have seen in the inspector, um, you can go in and actually look at the HTTP headers, right? And this is sort of the conversation that your browser has with the server before the file is actually sent. You know, it says like, hey, you know, I'm the browser, this is what browser I am, this is, what I'm, you know, this is the file I'm looking for, it's at this URL. You know, I'm willing to take it if it's HTML. I, I, can, I can unzip things if you send it zip. That's cool. And, and then the server says, OK, well, I've got this file, but you, there are some things you should know about this file. Uh, you know, it's a little old. You know, maybe you already have it cached. Here's the date that it last changed in case that's relevant to you. And so there's this sort of like back and forth that the browser and the server have um, to figure out like what's going to happen with this file delivery process. And each one of these things, I mean, you know, it doesn't take a lot of time, you know, a couple of milliseconds or whatever. Um, but it adds up, uh, and it adds up really fast. Um, and so you really, 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 you don't want to load 30 JavaScript files and 10 different CSS files and 400 different images and like all that stuff. It really slows things down. Um, so you really want to spend time working on reducing your HTTP connections. Um, these are the four and a half techniques that uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit. I'm not going to talk much about the last one, don't load stuff you don't need. Um, browsers, again, are pretty smart these days about uh, you know, not loading an image if the image isn't being displayed and that sort of thing. Um, but there are quirks. Um, our good friend Internet Explorer, for example, <laughs> will still, I don't know about them like IE 10 and fuzzy about 9, but I'm pretty sure in 8 and below, uh, you know, if you specify a font file that you're sending out, uh, IE will download the font file even if there's nothing on the page in that set in that font. Um, other browsers, not surprisingly, are smarter than that and won't grab the font file unless they need it for something. Um, but that also goes for like writing CSS. Uh, you know, like if you've got a whole bunch of selectors, 
that you know, are left over from a previous website or whatever, like don't leave them in your CSS files, just more for the browser to download. Um, but first one is combining CSS files. Um, there are a couple different approaches for this. Uh, one is if you're writing themes and stuff like that, you know, use a CSS preprocessor, something like SAS or less. I'm a huge SAS fan. Um, that you know, allows you to do sort of like you know, create partial files that all get sort of sucked into one main file. Uh, at Corner Shop, we have a base theme I've developed called Crate. And I've got probably you know, 18, maybe not that many, but you know, a bunch of like SAS partials, you know, header, footer, widgets, layout, you know, a couple of others, so that I've got sort of these like semantic divisions in my CSS, smaller files to work with, a little more modular. Um, but then they all get merged into one big CSS file at the end, so I don't, the user doesn't have to load like 10 different CSS files. Um, you know, if you're writing your own stuff and you don't want to use a CSS preprocessor, I'm sorry, you should get with CSS preprocessing, it's awesome. Um, but you know, only write one thing style CSS. Um, another option open to you is a plugin, something like W3 Total Cache. Um, I've, W3 Total Cache has some problems sometimes, but the point is, is that there are plugins out there that will uh, take your CSS files and smoosh them together and even minify them for you um, before it sends them out to the browser. Um, this is one of the very, very, very few things that I think Drupal actually does better than WordPress because Drupal Core has this baked in. But anyway, um, you didn't hear that from me. Um, combining JavaScript files, you know, same kind of deal. Um, you know, you can use a plugin, something like W3 Total Cache, uh, to combine your JavaScript files and compress them for you. Um, another important thing to do is to put all your jQuery plugins into a single file. You're developing a theme. You've got like, you know, 12 different jQuery plugins you're using. You know, you've got placeholder and you know a bunch of polyfills for IE and uh, you know cycle two for your slideshow and all this other stuff. You know, don't put them, you know, they, you know, when you get them, they're in separate min files or whatever. Um, don't enqueue all of those separate files. Just maintain one file called plugins.js. And so most of my themes load two JavaScript files. They load my plugins.js file and then my actual JavaScript for the theme that has the, like, the logic and the behaviors and stuff like that for the theme. Um, you shouldn't be loading 10 different jQuery plugin files as separate files. Um, this gets more complicated when your plugins, your JavaScript plugins are coming from your WordPress plugins. And so they're all adding stuff. And so you go into a WordPress site and you open up the source and there's like 30 different JavaScript files because you've got 30 different plugins and they each have their own copy of each of these J JavaScript things that they need and that sort of thing. And that's where something like W3 Total Cache can be convenient because it'll sort of smush those up for you even if they're coming from different plugins at different places. Um, but certainly if you're writing a theme, um, there's no excuse for having a whole bunch of JavaScript files. Um, next up is CSS sprites. Does everybody here know what a CSS sprite is? Yes, no, a couple no's. All right. Um, so this idea is that, you know, again, to reduce HTTP connections, uh, take all of your images to the extent possible. This doesn't really work with, like, you know, the featured image for blog posts, but, you know, the, like, the little bits and pieces and cruft that are part of your theme, um, and stick them all into one file together, one big giant ping, um, and then position them using CSS to sort of have that part of the image show in whatever little element you're talking about. Um, so a little demo here. This is from the, an older version of the Corner Shop creative website. Um, so this whole stack here on the left, that's all one image. That's actually one ping of all of these things sort of stacked one on top of each other. So that the browser only has to make one HTTP connection. You know, overall that file is 304 pixels wide, 9, 10 tall. It's a pretty big image when all said and done. But um, it's only one file. You only have to load it once. Then it's cached. Um, you know, it doesn't eat up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, 12 or 14 different image files. It's loading one image. Um, and then the CSS that you write actually sort of, you know, sets the height and width of the element that's displaying that and then sets this background image of Sprite and positions it so that it slides down and only shows my head in that spot. Um, it's a pretty cool trick. Um, it's worth taking the time to learn. It's a great way to save a lot of space uh, and reduce a lot of HTTP connections to use CSS Sprites. Um, it can be a real pain in the butt to use CSS sprites, particularly if you, know, you lay out your sprite file with all your dimensions, you're mapping, okay, this image is this size in my sprite file, so I need to write the CSS with the, the height and the width and the background position and all blah, 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 blah. And then the client comes back and says, well, we need our logo 10% bigger, and the logo is the one on the top. And so everything's position is changed by 10 pixels. Um, that's where something like SAS can actually come in handy. SAS has auto spriting tools. Um, well, I think it's part of Compass, not SAS, but anyway. Um, Another solution to reducing HTTP connections regarding images is to just not use images. Um, this can be very hard if you're working with a designer who is you know, maybe more print savvy than web savvy. 
Um, but CSS3 these days has pretty good cross-browser support, and there's lots of great polyfills for older browsers that don't deserve to have a good experience. Um, <laughs> but CSS3 can do gradients. CSS can do rounded corners. It can do text shadows and box shadows. It can rotate. It can 3D transform. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that you can do with CSS now. Um, and you should take advantage of that. Um, you know, you don't have to load image files for your background gradients and stuff like that. Or you can use image files as your fallbacks. You know, use a tool like Modernizer to set up some CSS classes that say, uh, does this browser support CSS gradients? And you can write some CSS to load image files if the browser doesn't, um, if you care about those people that don't care about you. Um, but the other huge advantage to not using images for a lot of these, you know, your, your rounded, glossy buttons with shadows and stuff like that, Another advantage gets back to the whole like Retina high DPI issue, that you know you don't have to double up your assets and create a high res version that looks good on an iPhone and stuff like that. You're doing it in CSS. The browser's generating it. The browser is going to take care of that stuff. You don't have to worry about your image looking fuzzy when everything else looks crisp and sharp. The stuff will look crisp and sharp. Um, sometimes you will encounter minor issues and glitches with you know your rounded corners are not clipping things properly and stuff like that. But um, really, this is. Uh, if it's not the present, it's certainly the future, that um, using, you know, using good designs that allow you to make use of a lot of CSS is a great way to make your site faster. Um, I mean, it does increases the overhead in the browser a little bit because it has to compute these gradients and stuff like that, but it's still faster than loading a bunch of images. And really, it's easier. Um, next up, this is the big, bad, horrible thing in the room, is uh, JavaScript blocking and the idea of sort of sequential loading in general. So when your browser is loading a bunch of assets, all these images and JavaScript files and CSS files, um, it can't do it all at the same time. Uh, it can load several files at the same time, uh, depending on your browser version. I think most of them are, uh, can load sort of, I think it's six files from the same host at the same time. Um, older versions of IE had a limit of two. Um, and I, yeah, and it's sort of, the number is constantly changing, but basically the idea is, is that um, and sort of the idea of best practices is that the browsers don't want to load more than you know six assets from a one domain at the same time uh, to sort of not you know it would be sort of easy to sort of accidentally do a DOS attack on a server by trying to load 30 assets all at the same time kind of thing. It sort of reduces the load on the server. It's a way of playing nice. Um, so your browser is only going to load you know a couple things at the same time um, from a given host. Um, and it's good that they can load some in parallel. It allows it to be, you know, loading up a font and an image and a, you know, and a CSS file all at the same time. You know, so by the time they're all done, it's, it doesn't take that long. Um, but there's some assets that behave a little differently than that. Um, and the main ones are JavaScript files. Fonts also are weird in some browsers, but um, JavaScript files are loaded in sequence, not in parallel with each other and not in parallel with anything else. So when your browser hits a page and it starts loading and it's, you know, parsing through the head, and it sees a JavaScript file, it stops doing basically everything else to load that JavaScript file. Once that file is loaded, it moves on to the next line, which is if it's another JavaScript file, it still stops and loads nothing but that JavaScript file and then moves on to the next one. So all this like loading in parallel and stuff like that doesn't start happening until it gets further down in the document um, and it's sort of past the JavaScript files. Um, the reason for that is actually um, pretty straightforward. I and mean, if you think about it, I mean, you know, unless you're in the fancy world of asynchronous JavaScript. Um, you know, the JavaScript is depending on certain things. You know, you don't want your plugins file for, you know, your jQuery stuff to finish loading before the actual jQuery library has finished loading. Um, so the browser, I mean, this is designed, this is intentionally designed this way, that the Java, you know, it stops doing everything, gets the JavaScript file, and then moves on to the next JavaScript file. Because you don't want something where, oh, the 5K JavaScript file with your, like, 10 lines of jQuery in it to control your drop-down menus, finishes loading before jQuery has loaded, because then your script will have an error because it won't know about jQuery yet, because jQuery won't be there. Um, so it's going to load just your JavaScript first, one at a time. And it, like each time it hits one, it basically it's like, everybody stop everything. I hit a JavaScript file. Let's just get this. OK, we got this. All right, now let's move on to everything else. So JavaScript files are like, you know, in terms of reducing HTTP connections, they're like the evilest of the evil, because they slow everybody else down. Um, so you really want to cut down on that. Um, so there are you know, a couple of solutions to this. Um, you know, in general, your JavaScript, if you can, you want to put it at the bottom of your page. 
Um, the idea being that then your browser can fetch your CSS. You know, you put your CSS at the top of your page. You know, your browser will load your CSS. The browser will load your HTML. It'll load the images. It'll sort of load everything first, and then it gets the JavaScript at the end. Um, and that's great because probably your JavaScript, you know, if it's jQuery kind of stuff, it's user interactions, it's slideshows, it's stuff like that that's maybe like you know not super critically important that the users see instantaneously. So this is this gets into the sort of perceived speed versus actual speed. Um, you know, rather than having a white screen until all of your JavaScript is finished loading and then continuing on with the rest of your file, um, you know, give the user the website, give them what you, give you what give them what you can, and then go fetch the JavaScript that you know starts creating the hovers and starts creating all that stuff. I mean, it's not going to take that much longer to get the JavaScript if you stick it at the end, um, and it gives your users something to see faster. Um, quick little nitpicky thing: um, there are two ways to load CSS. There's the link tag and the import the at import syntax. Um, in older versions of IE, again, I think they fixed this in 9 or 10, um, it treats it, IE treats the link, the import tag as basically a link tag located at the bottom of your page. So, you know, it's nice to have your CSS load first. That's why I say put it at the top because it styles everything up. It makes your page look good more quickly. You don't get the fout. Is anybody here to the fout? It's a flash of unstyled text. It's when your HTML page is loaded, but your CSS hasn't. So everything looks like crap for a split second, and then your CSS loads. Um, so you, you, know, you might have fout issues if you've got a bunch of JavaScript ahead of your CSS, because your browser is going to be hitting that JavaScript first. Um, so you put the CSS at top. So if you're using uh, the at import thing in certain versions of IE, it's going to load that CSS basically last at the bottom of the page. Um, and I mean, it's not the end of the world. It's not going to make your site load faster, but it's going to, like, you could bring up styles. You know, have a little love for your IE users, maybe. Um, WordPress specific tip here when you're enqueuing a script. Uh, these are the arguments uh, that go into that function for enqueuing a script. Uh, you know, it's the name of the script, you know, the actual URL or whatever, any dependencies, a version. And then the last argument, and I, it, it just bugs me. To no end that they made this the last argument because then you have to like if you don't care about these other things you have to pass like you know null or empty arrays or whatever so people just don't get around to it. The last argument is in footer. So if you set that to true, that pushes your JavaScript down so that rather than being loaded as a part of WP head, it loads it as a part of WP footer. And so it sticks your JavaScript in the footer. That's a good thing. You probably want jQuery to always load at the top, but everything else, all your plugins and everything like. Load it in the footer, and then you know it'll come last. It'll come after your styles and after your page all been loaded. Um, this also brings up you know a thing that you want to make sure you write your CSS well. Um, you know one of the things that's you know you've got a slideshow, and before the JavaScript is loaded, your slideshow winds up being really really tall. Have you seen a page like that that takes a little while to load, and so all the images are stacked one on top of each other, and then the script kicks in, and then they all get absolutely positioned on top of each other. You know add a little bit of CSS statement to the containing element, so giving it a max height. So that all of those images that stack until the slider has loaded, you know, just aren't visible, um, and then people won't really even notice. Um, and load your JavaScript at the end, and it's like, I mean, they they won't even know that you're being smart and making the page load a little bit faster. Um, last thing, wow, I'm tearing through this. I've been talking really fast. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I've been talking really. Ugh. All right. So the last thing is DNS lookups. Um, these can eat up a little bit of time, particularly on mobile. So a DNS lookup, listen to me going slower. Uh, <laughs> each domain mentioned on your page, so you know, your site or googleapis.com, which I showed earlier, or you know, twitter.com if you're loading like a Twitter follow script, or facebook.com if you're loading like a Facebook like box or like button or anything like that. Um, you know, every domain, if you know how the internet works, every domain points to an IP address or something like that. Um, your browser needs to do an IP address lookup on every domain it encounters. Now, a lot of those it will have cache. You know, Facebook and Twitter. You know, if you're like most people, you probably hit those sites regularly or visit enough sites that have those things embedded that your browser already has them cached. But it might not. Um, different browsers also cache those results for different lengths of time. It's different from the actual DNS record caching. Um, it's a different kind of caching. But uh, basically, it takes. A fraction of a second for each, you know, for your browser to figure out where the server is for each of those things. Um, so if you have, you know, a hundred different, you know, dot com domains in your site because you're loading jQuery from this place and Twitter from that place and some script from this other place and images from this other place and whatever, 
Uh, eventually, that can get to a point where it's sort of suboptimal for your page load time because your browser is just having to go out to too many different places to ask questions and get those DNS queries resolved. Um, so, I mean, there's no hard and fast rule, but it's like, you know, keep it under six ish, um, depending on how many resources you're loading from each. Um, but the thing to know, and this goes back to something I was saying earlier, um, too few domains is bad too uh, because you can only load probably six assets from one domain at a time. So if you have things spread across a couple of different domains, you actually can load more things in parallel because you can get six from this domain at the same time you're getting six from this domain, at the same time you're getting six th from this domain. So there's actually sort of a, a pro-con balance between the number of domains you have and the, your site performance. Um, a lot of major carriers for a while, and I think a lot of them are still doing it, and they're trying to figure out if it still makes sense because browsers are catching up, um, would do what's called domain sharding. Uh, so you, if you actually go in and look at like the source of, I think YouTube still does it and a couple others, um, you'll see that a lot of the assets that's loading aren't actually located on YouTube.com. They'll be located at you know, yt, you know, yt1.yt.com and yt2.yt.com. Um, and part of the reason for that is, you know, for their own infrastructure reasons to distribute load across their servers and that sort of thing. Um, but another reason they might be doing that is they've sharded their sort of central domain into different prefixes um, so that you're not trying to hit, you're not caught, it's like, you know, they've figured out, they looked at their page and said, hey, you need to load eight assets from us, but your browser can only get six at a time, so let's split into two domains. And so you can load six from one domain while at the same time you're loading the other two. And so it's faster to have two domains than it is to have one domain wait for the six and then get the other two. Does that make sense? Um, it's sort of wonky. This is stuff that, I mean, this, this is like, you've got to be really serious about your front end optimization if you're taking the time to think about like domain sharding and DNS lookups and stuff like that. But I just wanted to sort of point it out as, uh, you know, one of the things that affects your front end performance um, and how fast it takes. Um, DNS lookups in particular, by the way, um, due to you know, the latency of mobile, uh, DNS lookups and HTTP connections are, are more insidious on mobile than they are typically on you know, a, a desktop or a more traditional broadband connection. Um, a lot of mobile connections have very high throughput. You know, your 4G is very fast. It can send you lots of data all at once. Um, but they, they still have delays in how long it takes for that throughput to get started, basically. And so the more little back and forths you have, like DNS things and HTTP connections, um, those things take longer on mobile than they do sort of relatively compared to desktop. Um, even if it takes the same amount of time to send that 40K image once it's started, it took longer to get the 40K image started. Um, wow, this is a really old screenshot. Um, if you haven't checked out like, you know, Chrome's developer tools or Safari's dev tools, so the latest version of Safari, not even the latest, but like they totally changed them and so I'm sort of stuck in Chrome dev tools. But, um, there are lots of tools that you can use to sort of inspect your own pages and see, hey, how many assets am I loading and how long is it taking? So this is a snapshot of Corner Shop Creative from probably a year and a half ago. Um, you know, it's got like the main HTML file up top, then a bunch of the CSS files, then the, you know, the web fonts it's loading, and we've got too many web fonts, but whatever. Um, you know, so, and what you can learn from this is you can see the order that things are being loaded in, and you can also see the timing. So you can see here that it took a long time. It took like three seconds just about for the, like the HTML page to even load at all. Um, this, was, uh, this was before we put it behind a cache. Um, so it didn't even start looking for the CSS files until it had gotten far enough along in the main HTML file. Um, then it at least started these all at basically the same time and was loading them all at basically the same time. But you know, you get a big web page and you open it up and you, look, you know, click on the network tab. You'll probably have to reload the page if you didn't have it open when you first hit the page. You'll get this awesome timeline that'll show you and it'll color the dots by the kind of asset, if it's an image or a JavaScript file or whatever. And you can see how long did, you know, the sort of the light blue is like, that's the latency. That's like sort of how long it took from when I first asked for the file to when the file started coming. And then that little blue at the end is how long it actually took to send the file itself once it started coming. Um, but you'll get a nice little timeline that'll show you like, okay, this stuff started loading and then this stuff started loading. It'll be sort of the staggered list, like that diagram a couple slides back. And you can see you know, sort of what loaded in parallel and what came when and what got loaded before what. Um, and you can really get a breakdown of like, what are the things that are loading last that I want loading first? What are the things that are loading slow that I might need to put on a different server? Or you, know, you just kind of see like, where's the load coming from? Um, 
So this is sort of a, a DIY approach to you know, optimizing your site, is to just actually go in yourself and look at it and see how it's doing. Um, there are other tools um, out there that will do some of this for you in addition to some of the front end stuff that I've talked about here that will do sort of a more comprehensive audit uh, that will also look at your server settings to see if you're gzipping your files before they go to browsers and uh, a bunch of other stuff. The, the two that I recommend or are most familiar with, um, the one I used for a long time was called Y Slow. Uh, it's from Yahoo, it's, so it's Y exclamation point slow, because um, Yahoo still has an exclamation point in their name. Um, you know, it's like you can get it as a browser plugin or you can just do it as a URL sort of thing or where you put in your URL and it gives you, you know, the breakdown and it gives you, it's like a, it'll give you like a letter grade and it'll divide it into different sections of like how many assets were you loading and how many different domain names did you refer to and how big were your assets and, you know, they have sort of an algorithm that they think is the best, you know, here are ways you can improve your site performance and they'll get mad at you for some things that might not matter like the expires tags and your Apache headers and stuff like that. But um, it'll provide a really good sort of snapshot of, of what's wrong or, uh, you know, very obvious low-hanging fruit of things you can do to improve. Um, the other one is called PageSpeed from Google. Um, it's uh, also available as a Chrome plugin and also like a website you can uh, enter a URL into. Um, and Google, you know, it's the same kind of deal. It's measuring a lot of the same criteria. I haven't done a lot of sort of side-by-side -side comparisons to see if like my site, my personal style score is higher in Yahoo or PageSpeed, but um, they do pretty similar things. They're, you know, they're looking at all the stuff I've talked about here as well as a bunch of other stuff to sort of figure out um, what are the opportunities for you to, in, you know, decrease your load time. Recently, I'm not sure if recently is the last year or two, but uh, Google has sort of forked PageSpeed. So PageSpeed, in addition to being this like assessment and analytic tool that will look at your site and tell you what you're doing wrong and what you could be doing better, um, PageSpeed is now also a server service that some web hosts will offer or you could hook up with. You know, it's a, it's a whole API where basically Google now wants to also be your, your content delivery network. Um, like if you're, if you're on DreamHost or something like that, there's actually a little checkbox in your, your domain setup that says you use Google PageSpeed. And you click one box and save it. And from sort of that point forward, if you look at the source of all of your, your WordPress pages, it's not loading the CSS from your domain. It's loading it with these weird file names that are being hosted by Google because chances are Google servers are faster and closer and you know, it's the whole Edge CDN thing. Um, so it, when you, if you, you know, go Google PageSpeed to get the browser plugin and stuff like that, um, don't be too confused because PageSpeed is this product slash service to make your pages faster. It's also an analytic tool to see what you can do to make your pages faster. Um, so just sort of a quick FYI on that. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, if you want more, um, Steve Souter is the name of a guy who uh, is sort of the go-to for a lot of this. If he doesn't do the research himself, he is, you know, following other people and raising questions of other people who are doing browser benchmarks and stuff to figure out what the fast way is. You know, he'll have a blog post on, you know, DNS sharding and whether or not it still makes sense and that kind of thing. Um, also, uh, this first one here is, uh, the, I believe, the official link for Google page speed, which is not as ugly as an Amazon URL, but still not great. Um, oh, wait, no, that's the bottom one. What's the top? Well, oh yeah, so the, the, the top Google developers one here is sort of documentation. That's, that has a lot of the stuff in this presentation. It's going to have tips and explanations for why PageSpeed looks for these things and what's going on and what they recommend you do sort of in detail. The, the link at the bottom is the actual PageSpeed tool. Um, so if you want to just learn about why Google thinks what you're doing is good or bad, um, why slow has a similar sort of documentation of like, these are why we think these things make your site faster and why we gave you an F. Um, so that's that. Um, so that's it. Uh, I think I'm right on time. Um, again, I'm Ben Byrne. I'm corner, Ben at Corner Shop Creative. Drywall, drywall, and the snow leopard photo, if you've seen that anywhere on the name tag or whatnot. Um, also, quick note, because I'm shameless, uh, Corner Shop, we are looking to hire a back-end developer. So if you've got serious back-end WordPress slash Drupal chops, uh, we're more WordPress than Drupal, but we need uh, more Drupal help, um, and, y and you want a cool job where you work from home working for nonprofits, uh, come find me. Thanks everybody for your time. I hope I didn't go too fast.